Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming out tonight to, um, for the to celebrate the launch of Ian Sfinonius' newest book, Censorship Now. His previous books before this were um, first The Psychic Soviet, published by Drag City Records and Books, and um, also Supernatural Strategies for Making a Rock and Roll Group, published by Akashic, which also published this new book. And as you guys probably all no, Ian is an accomplished, accomplished musician for many decades, for two decades, not that many decades. <laughs> and star of the film Moondust by Scott Reeder. I just threw that in there. Thanks so much, Ian. Here he is. Structured society, appending their own state to create something altogether new, so are we, the rock and rollers of the earth, fearless in our condemnation and prosecution of our inherited expression, ideology, culture, life. We shall explore the various malfeasances and wrongdoings of rock and roll with clear vision, and we shall uphold whatever are the conclusions of this pitiless tribunal. This court, then, with vengeance as its guide, accuses rock and roll. The ideology, the music, the industry, the art form, the so-called lifestyle as being guilty of crimes against peace, of mind controlling the masses, of propagating the lies of freedom and liberty, of high treason, and of cruelly abusing the trust given to it by its enthralled, mesmerized, and beholden constituency. This trial is both a grave responsibility and quite an experimental judicial proceeding. After all, what is rock and roll? What is this thing that we are accusing of such heinous acts? We defer to an expert on the subject, Dr. Fran Fine, chairperson of the Phonophobic Society. Rock and roll is a music form or sound, yes, but it is also a vague and insidious ideology which seeks to impress itself into the very DNA of the minds, souls, and societies it infiltrates. It is a music that drives its listeners to insanity and antisocial behavior, and which co-ops and exploits insanity for its own uses. It is a form which, exported around the world, serves as a soft weapon for the ruling clique to propagate a capitalist ideology and all its loathsome tenets, liberalism and individualism, selfishness, so-called liberty, anti-intellectualism, and, perhaps most destructive of all, coolness a.k.a. the blasé attitude which displays contempt for compassion, caring, community, as well as both intellectual and emotional engagement. Rock and roll is intolerant. It demolishes all other culture than itself, 
By being almost entirely undefined, it can successfully integrate local forms and pervert them for its own uses, thereby destroying all difference in the world and making new markets easier to incorporate and control under a single hegemon. It enjoys a detached relationship to suffering and sins, whereby these forms are utilized as stage names appreciate the actual experience suffering. Thank you, Thank Dr. You, Dr. Fine. Fine. Where's the Where's evidence for such crime? crime? The, evidence the evidence of guilt, guilt total, total and cold-blooded, cold is in the grooves of the records themselves, themselves, on the airwaves, airwaves confessed, confessed, even bragged about, about at high volume by the notes, songs, songs tunes, and images of the performers. Let's take, Let's a, take look. a look. All the evidence we need to prosecute this case has been represented in the music contained on these record albums and in the statements made by rock and roll's authors, assassins, and drug abusers of the last 50 years who have brought civilization to the precipice of ruin with their ideology of selfishness and individualism. Indeed, rock and roll is a neo-satanic form which worships not only pleasure, pleasure and immediate gratification, gratification, but idolatry, personal gain, and is, in its use by the ruling clique, a Trojan horse, a delivery system for imperialism and capitalism. The evidence. The evidence. Listen. Listen. <laughs> by the victims of rock and roll. Just some of the countless victims speak about their abuse at the hands of rock. Rock and roll made me lose my money, my memory, my emotion. It was as destructive as any force I had witnessed. I would scream, contort my body, heave myself about. Sometimes I would blast the music at extreme amplification without regard for my health or those around me. It led me to wear strange things on my person. I didn't realize my love for rock and roll was merely the enforcement of individualist ideology elitism, sociopathy, and consumerism. Rock and roll started as a simple hobby or enthusiasm, but it led me to life entrepreneurial endeavors. Crunching numbers, collecting receipts, starting limited liability corporations, renting vehicles, and creating plastic products. I began to spend most of my time in a solipsistic bubble on the internet, using social media to promote myself and my group's so-called mission. We thought we were making music, but we were actually just rehabilitating the invasions of foreign countries and promoting nationalism required to explain military expansionism.
stuff people into a room filled over capacity, or they're forced to stare at a shabby proscenium. People buy unlikely the characters and making garbled noises and making strange gestures. This form is used to enforce the consumer-producer relationship. Obediency, complacency, and the idea that expression and emotion is something to be experienced as a simulation in exchange for money, and not directly. us and for what? Why? What was their intent? It is incomprehensible. The originators of the form are deceased, no longer with us. They were struck down for mortality either by rampant orgiastic pleasure cruising or narcotic affluence. Can we prosecute in good conscience the modern perpetrators of the form? The rock groups which work the circuit day and night, creating records, noise, performances, sleeping on couches and worming their ways into the consciousness of the people? Yes, we can. We have one of them captured here. Hey, you, buddy. What do you have to say in your defense? Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, that's right. Rock and roll is on trial, and culture is on trial. And I want to congratulate all of us. Let's give ourselves a round of applause for putting culture on trial, because we have come a long way. That's right. That's right. We have come a long way from just, I don't know, 10 years ago, when you were huddled alone and scared in your house, and you were afraid to leave the house without an American flag taped to your face. Well, we've come a long way. We've been fighting. We've been resisting. There's been some ugly moments, but we've come a long way. And things, things are better. But we're not done yet, are we? That's right. Critical self-examination. And, a, and a, you know, we, we never had a cultural revolution in this country. Not a real one. And that's what we're on our way to. And let's give ourselves a big pat on the back. That's right. That... Now, this book is just a little part. It's just a shred. It's just a shred of this, this uh, destructive urge, which is, you know, none of us are satisfied with the narrative that we've been given. And we're, uh, we're tearing at it every day. I see you. You know, anyway. And this book is just a small part of that, and hopefully it does. I think it, it goes farther than any book. It goes farther than any book yet. That's right. It's called Censorship Now. That's right. It's the only book that's bold enough to uh, demand uh, censorship, a people censorship, not a censorship prescribed by a church or a government, but our own censorship. We have to abolish, burn, destroy the narrative that we're being given every day that is making us literally sick. So anyway, rock and roll is on trial, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling to be on the stand and uh, serving penance. That's right, penance. That's right. None of us are afraid of a little self-flagellation. Anyway, so the book is, uh, it just came out. In fact, I think it isn't even out, but it's already making waves. People are pretty excited about it. <laughs> People are talking about it a lot, yeah. In fact, there's already been a documentary that's being made about the making of censorship now, yeah. Yeah, that's right, because you know that there's this documentary craze. You know about this documentary craze, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, rock and roll, we're involved in rock and roll. Probably all of you are. I don't know. I don't want to make assumptions, but let's face it. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to spot you. So anyway, we're all involved in this thing, rock and roll. And, you know, rock and roll, as you know, is the ultimate art form. It's really crushed, demolished everything in its path. It's like a kind of plague of locusts or, a, you know, just some crazy seaweed. It just... 
devours everything. And why, why is that? Why is that? You're wondering, why is that? Why, why, why are we on top of the heap? Why are we at the top of the food chain? Why are we destroying everything in our path? Why are we relentless? People in the beginning of rock and roll, they said, rock and roll will never die. You know, they, there was like, no, like, you know, they, they don't dismiss us as a fad. And they were right, you know, because it was the ultimate art form and it, and it just is unstoppable and it's ferocious and it's voracious for better or for worse. And that's our choice whether to make it for better or for worse because we are rock and roll. That's right. It's whatever we want it to be. So, um, so anyway, it's the ultimate. Why is it the ultimate art form? Because, you know, you know what art is. It's just, it's the person signing their work. That's what it is. It's the bourgeois revolution to, to destroying the aristocracy. They used the artist. You know, I mean, you know all this. But anyway, you know, they, they got the artist to, to be their, their imp, their warrior, their knight, the ruling class, the bourgeoisie, who actually have no talent. They just use their money. That's what capitalist is. Capitalist is somebody who uses their money to make money. So, you know, the artist was always just their little, their servant, and they were, you know, using the artist to explain, to explain their actions and to heroicize themselves. And as you know, you know, the aristocracy had another imp. They had the cleric, they had the priest who said, well, God, you know, God is the reason for this situation. So the, so the, the bourgeoisie, the, the, the money people, you know, the, the, you know, the whatever you want to call them, the middle class, they, uh, they had to get rid of the God and they invented the art. So, so they got, you know, the, the art and blah, 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 and you know the rest. Anyway, and then, you know, the main thing, the, the reason, you know, art of course existed before, but there was no signature attached. The signature is what made the artist special. It made the artist into a heroic exponent of idea, you know, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. So the artist's signature is very, special. It's a very special thing. And you've seen Picasso's signature. We all know what Picasso's signature looks like. But the reason the rock and roll group is the ultimate, the ultimate, they're the ultimate artists is because the rock and roll group is the signature. They are the signature. They just, they, a rock and roll group doesn't even have to do anything. Other artists are known for their work. They have to do things. The rock and roll group doesn't have to do anything. They just need to have a name. And, uh, you know what I'm talking about. You know, everybody in this room probably has a black flag tattoo somewhere on their body. <laughs> but most people have, don't, most of these people never listen to black flag. <laughs> it just means something to them. It means hard work, cynicism, black humor. It means, uh, you know, you know what it means. It means black flag. It's an ideology, it's a cult, it has very little to do with the records. The Grateful Dead, the Dancing Bear, the, the Steal Your Face, Steal Your Face, it doesn't mean you listen to, to the Grateful Dead, it means you're a grubby sensualist who <laughs> hates pretense and you hate authority. And, and, and that's what it means. And deadheads don't listen to the Grateful Dead. They just are deadheads. And they embody this thing. So the, so the, the, yeah, so the rock and roll group, they, they are the ultimate, the ultimate artist because they are the signature. They embody the signature. And um, because of that, there's this big memoir craze, this big documentary craze that's going on. It's, uh, it's, it's because, you know, when you are, don't have to make work, you still have to explain what you are. You have to historicize yourself. You know, a memoir, anybody can do it. It's like pornography. Its whole purpose is just to assure the viewer, the reader, that they're alive. That's all it is. So, uh, so anyway, so, you know, so somebody, I don't know, some people were like, yeah, let's make a documentary about the making of censorship now. The book, which threatens to be an underground smash bestseller. Because, why? Because it's so radical, it goes farther than anybody in this kind of, in our, you know, collective hatred for the, for the narrative that we've been, you know, that 
you know, you know what I'm saying. So anyway, so yeah, so these people were like, oh yeah, let's make a documentary on the making of censorship now. I was like, well, it seems like everybody's doing it. Um, I haven't seen the, the I haven't seen, I, I, I actually have a, uh, a trailer for it. I think they're using it to make a Kickstarter. Um, I, I haven't actually seen it, but if you guys want to watch it with me, do you guys want to watch it? Okay, I don't know what it, I don't know what it is, but let's let's give it a go. Fuck it. Censorship. Feel the stuff on the radio all. Censorship. Censorship. Feel the stuff on the television all. Censorship. 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 Censorship.
So, uh, yeah, so that's the documentary. I don't know. It's like, it seems like the thing to do. Um, people are, you know, hell. In fact, we even discussed the documentary Craze in the book Censorship Now. Anyway, so, yeah. Um, it's interesting, you know, the documentary, the rock documentary has become almost like, uh, it's as formulaic as a pop song. It, it's a reassuring thing for people to see. It has the same narrative. Um, each one has the same narrative. And the primary uh, elements are, of course, you know, you need a celebrity endorser, you need a, you need a influential critic, you need, um, uh, you need, you know, a friend or some kind of inside type character, you know, and then, uh, you know, and um, uh, in fact, you know, I've noticed about the rock documentaries because it's my job to uh, watch some of them every, every now and then, you know, uh, that each one of them, you know, the, the uh, they actually, uh, the, you know, they kind of, you know, they're, they're, they all follow the same template and I guess it was all, it was, uh, you know, it was started by the first rock and roller, um, Frankenstein. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, uh, when Mary Shelley, you know, wrote Frankenstein, uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, she really started something. And uh, people, you know, it's sort of, you know, that it's just everybody has to uh, sort of follow suit in some kind of way. You know, they can push against the restraints of this format, but ultimately they're just going to, you know, there's all, you know, there's, it's always, you know, creation, then a resentment of the martinet, kind of a bad thing happens, you know, and then some kind of metaphysical triumph, you know, an uplifting story at the end. So uh, anyway, since documentaries are so important to the rock and roll form, I thought that maybe we should do a workshop here today um, before I'm going to sign some books. I'm going to sign some books, but uh, if you want to buy a book, I will sign it. And I actually made a special stamp for the afternoon because you came here after Halloween. And I know it was difficult because you were removing all that makeup. But, uh, but anyway, so as a reward, I made a special stamp. And, um, but in, in any case, before we did that, before we get down to brass tacks, I, I thought we should do a little workshop because I wanted you to come away with something besides just some egotistical self-aggrandizing up here, you know. I wanted to also give something to you. Uh, which, and because, you know, when, you know, ultimately you're going to make a documentary about yourself, but to, make, to get your documentary made, you're also going to have to be in other people's documentaries, you know. So maybe I thought I thought maybe we should like do a little practice run or something, uh, you know, like making a documentary and you know, and it's like, uh, yeah, are you guys interested in trying something like that? Yeah. Really? Excellent. Well, in that case, we're going to need some volunteers, some kind of like, uh, we're going to need some uh, some people to, you know, like a work. I guess I've never been to a workshop, but I guess. People get involved, right? Would it, who would like to be involved with the, this thing? Oh, excellent, you two. Let them out. Okay, I think we have enough chairs up here. Here, you can use my chair. You have to, you have to sit up here, really close together to one another. Um, so basically, oh, excellent, <laughs> fantastic. So basically, um, yeah, maybe you could, you could, uh, Sounds good. you know, everybody, yeah, every documentary has to have a celebrity endorser. The, the main thing about uh, documentaries is they're, they're a great chance to settle scores and revise history according to your own desires. And that's a real concern for all of us. So you're, you're, you're going to play the influential critic. But I actually need a couple more workshop volunteers. Oh, fantastic. OK, you're going to play the fan. Every documentary has to have a, have a fan because, you know. Um, 
Okay, what about, you know, they all, every documentary also needs a friend. Oh, yeah, would you play the friend? That would be fantastic, thanks. Because a friend is somebody, they're on the, they're on the ground and they kind of have a special insight. But, you know, the significant other is a big catch and a lot of, a lot of, di a lot of documentaries don't get the significant other because of some, I don't know, contractual dispute or something. But uh, this one, we're gonna, we're gonna, so would somebody like to be the significant other? Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Thank you. All right, and then, um, and then we need, there's a very, sm oh, then there's a manager character, like a, a manager, <laughs> kind of a, you know, um, you know, manager. Uh, the manager kind of, you know, because probably the subject is, you know, because the rock and roll, they're kind of not very well spoken. So the manager is kind of a mouthpiece or something. <laughs> Phil, would you like? <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> this will be very fast. I know this seems like a big production, but it's going to be really quick. Oh, fantastic. Would you mind standing over here, though? You guys should be really. Let's get tight. Okay. This is, you know, we, like every film, you know how it is when you're in a film and you become like a little family for that little month out in, 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 in Indonesia. And then it's over and you never speak to those people ever again. Okay, and now I have one more character that needs to be, that, now you only have one line, but it's really important. Uh, so would somebody mind doing that? What, what about you, Laura? <laughs> That's cool. John? Oh, fantastic, thank you. Here, I'm gonna bring a chair over, so. Fantastic, so I'm gonna pass the microphone around. So you're the studio engineer. Okay. Okay, excellent. Okay, can we, can we, uh, that's, can we get the available at uh, Ugga Bugga down? <laughs> Thanks to Alex for this slide projector. All right. <clears throat> I remember Frankenstein. The story of the Frankenstein monster. Before Brando, James Dean, or Elvis Presley, there was Frankenstein's monster. Everyone knows the monster. As big as the Beatles, Madonna, Stalin, War Dylan, Warhol, or Anne Rand. The monster is as influential a cultural figure as anyone. With his quick temper, violent disposition, outsider image, and unreconstructed infantilism, he is the template for Western masculinity. His influence can be seen today in every area of life. He was a precursor to genetic engineering and the, and the, the s s transformative surgeries which are so commonplace today, and yet few know his real story. Born from a laboratory experiment, the Frankenstein was comprised of stolen limbs from a graveyard, which were sewn together by a cunning doctor named Victor Frankenstein. His undead body was put outside during an electrical storm and struck by lightning, which gave him life and let him walk. Though he was his father's pride and joy, Frankenstein was a bit wild and out of control of society. Manufactured, electrified, and incoherent, he was the first rock and roller. Before, before Frankenstein, there was nobody like him. 
No one who had limbs and organs from other people. No one can really imagine what it was like. Now the idea of a golem created by a mad doctor in a laboratory out of a decaying body pests up oh, sorry, out of a decaying body parts is just totally normal. But back then it was really wild. He changed everything. When he came around, you could see the change immediately. Everyone started dressing in old clothes, wearing bangs, stitched up foreheads, orthopedic boots. People I knew at school saw Frankenstein, and the next day you'd see them walking pigeon-toed with bad posture. The first time I saw Frankenstein, it was like, wow. The rumor was that he was actually created using electricity that his manager had constructed him out of old, unused body parts and given him life with a lightning bolt. Since electricity is really the primary component of rock and roll, it was like, wow, he really rocked, you know? The fact that he was composed of different body parts, Frankenstein was kind of a collage man. Very modernist, very Dada. <laughs> A composite of different cultures, influences, and people, and yet totally alienated. This resonated with the audience since they felt that even though their particular limb might not be part of Frankenstein, he was of the people, quite literally. Frankenstein's meteoric rise to infamy began soon after the doctor unleashed him on an unsuspecting world. His potential was realized when he killed the doctor's crippled assistant, Fritz, strangled his ma master's mentor, and then murdered a child by a pond. But it wasn't all fun and games. He would get moody. He couldn't speak. People kept saying he was just a manufactured star created by a star machine like the monkeys or Millie Vanilli or something. And that bothered him a lot. People described him as an animal after he drowned that little girl in the pond. But he was really the opposite of an animal. He was created by science, not by some rutting critter in the dark. The little girl represented the innocence of a pre-industrial age. And by throwing her in the pond, Frankenstein was sending a message. The days of pastoral bliss are over. Now is the age of shambling, grunting death machines. You have to understand, Frankenstein came around as a rebuttal to romanticism. The romantics, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron, have been reveling in the natural world and man's heroic spirit as part of it. But then Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was born, which laid waste to their entire movement. Frankenstein could be said to be the godfather of heavy metal, science fiction, drone warfare, condominiums, and even personal computers themselves. Frankenstein represented a new breed of monster, really. <laughs> the collusion of science and technology and the new capitalist class image of themselves as gods. Inventors, not just of machines, but of life itself. The old monsters, the ghosts, vampires, and werewolves, were manifestation of the workers' hatred of the feudal gentry. They were tied up in proletarian superstitions and paranoia, but the Frankenstein represented a new paradigm, the workers' hatred of the industrial capitalist and his machines. Everyone hated us. We were against the grain. People weren't ready for us. They hunted us with pitchforks, they burned us with torches, chased us onto a boat where we floated into oblivion. Just because they were scared that this sewn up assemblage of cadavers created by a megalomaniac scientist was gonna eat them or turn them into hamburger. I gotta say one thing. With all the inevitable, um with the, the inevitable, uh, with the fame, Frankenstein inevitably was given a record contract. 
For that first record, I got the A-team in here. Guys who played on a million hit records, I wanted to capture the essence of the monster, which was new technology, the ego of the ruling class, science gone out of control, the blurry line between God and man, and how the little people could never understand the future or appreciate the great man who might bring it, it forth. So we went with a heavy guitar sound, some gated drums, and lots of compression. The monster didn't play anything on the record. They just want him to embody primal energy, as much as Iggy Pop or James Brown. The monster represented the id, the unbridled, amoral force of the universe. So they just had him chained to the wall, groaning, doing his thing. In a lot of ways, Frankenstein predicted the issues the industry had with sampling later on. Like, who gets credit for what? I mean, Frankenstein was a lot like a sampled man created out of discarded parts. Frankenstein's career was cut unfairly short when an angry mob cornered him in an old m mill and burned him alive. The mob cornered him in an old mill. The mill was a symbol of the pre-industrial ingenuity. It was the mob's symbolic but completely futile refutation of the industrialization that was being forced upon them. That changed them from human beings into factory cogs. Human gristle. When he got burned up in the windmill, the record really took off. <laughs> Everyone who torched the building wanted a little memento, and it became like a legend, a real collector's item. His legacy is hard to underestimate, overestimate. The creation of the star by a visionary producer, the star's resentment of the controlling martinet, the public's horrified fascination, which culminated in them murdering him, the subsequent co codification of the monster into a kind of outlaw sex symbol. This pattern is repeated again and again with pop groups like the Monkees, In Sync, the Fat Boys, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, etc. Yeah, as time went on, Frankenstein wasn't just a dead star, but a real icon. You, know, you see teenagers now grunting, walking with bad posture, wearing baggy clothes. That's all Frankenstein. You know, and those stupid kids don't even know it. He really brought a lot of self-respect to all the other monsters out there, even those who weren't created in a lab like him. In a sense, though, all of us monsters are created by humans. They need us to rehabilitate their own despicable behavior. Frankenstein was the first gadget. He foretold the age of electrical dependency. People laughed at Frankenstein because he was dependent on electricity. Now everyone is plugged into the wall, whether it's with their cell phone or their computer. Once people's tempers cooled down, Frankenstein started being seen in a more sympathetic light. Instead of being the cutting edge of the trauma and terror of capitalist exploitation and scientific overreach, he became a symbol of its quaint beginnings, and people wanted him back, back on stage, back in the studio. <laughs> As opposed to all, all the other dead rockers, Frankenstein had started out dead anyway. We figured reconstituting his burned up flesh wouldn't be inauthentic not that much different than his initial career. So we found the old doctor's blueprints and juiced him up again. And he's more popular than ever. We're doing the Hopscotch Festival, Pitchfork, Coachella, and Roz Killed this year. Then a stint in Australia after wrapping up some West Coast dates. Has he changed? Well, yeah, but after all that, who wouldn't? You know, there's the limos, the autographs, the drugs, the late night hotel parties. You know, all that travel can really burn you out. But you know, deep down, he's still just my Frankenstein. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good job. That's my first workshop. That was pretty cool. I feel like I feel, I feel way more prepared for my next uh, interview for a documentary. That was, uh, 
Thanks a lot. Oh, man. Anyway, so you can, you'll be able to rent that on Netflix and... Yeah, you were there. Anyway, so thanks a lot for coming to this book signing. And, um, you know, I'm actually uh, also, I'm going to appear at the Billy Wilder Theater on Wednesday, and I'm going to have a whole other presentation. <laughs> so uh, if you want to come to that, it's at 7 o'clock and it's free. But in the meantime, I, oh, does anybody have any questions before I sign some books? Does anybody have any questions? Come on. <laughs> no, uh, you don't have to have any questions. If you don't have any, you know. I think I explained myself pretty fucking well. <laughs> no, um, oh, what's next? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Just censorship now. I'm probably going to retire on it. Because it is a, I you know it really is time for this book. Hey, <laughs> you know I envy that child because they're being born into a world where censorship now exists. <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, no, I want to thank uh, Wendy and Laura Owens and uh, everybody here at the Ooga Booga and Three Five Six, Ethan and Anthony, whose birthday it is, and Sophia and. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, but uh, once again, I'm not saying you can't answer a question. I just want to get that stuff out of the way. Hoarders. Well, there's a spirited defense of hoarders in the book. It's an un, it's an unexpurgated defense of hoarders, and it's just you know, it's just talking about maybe you should buy some stuff at the Ooga Booga shop because. We refuse to be told that we can't own anything by the Apple fascism, by the, or the, by the internet fascism, the, you know, the idea that we're supposed to put everything on the ether. Well, you know, let me just say that this, uh, unless we resist, this entire era, this last 20 years is going to be looked at in the future as a period when nobody did anything, because all your old computers aren't going to have, you know, the cable. There's not, not going to be, a, you know, the operating system's going to be out of date. All those photographs are gone forever. All that music's gone forever. All those movies are gone forever. All that writing is gone forever. And the correspondence. There's not going to be any book of, you know, like the Civil War letters or the, 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 you know, the letters from, you know, I don't know. Somebody, well, it's all going to be gone, and this is going to be seen as some kind of dark age. There will be theories about what happened unless we resist and we get some books from the Ooga Booga shop. And, put them in a safe space. So that's my answer. Would you have any comment? <laughs> would, would you have a comment to someone who's contemplating purchasing your book via Kindle? Oh, I mean, <laughs> different strokes for different folks. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you know, the idea of the book, I mean, the book was made really for people who maybe don't read very much. So a lot of thought was put into, the, you know, there's some collages in here, and there's like, you know, it's, it's not, and, and also, it's, you know, it's bad for your eyes to look at those screens. But this whole thing, whatever. Anyway, go on. What's your favorite rock documentary? Or a biography? I mean, wow. I don't know. You know, I like, you know, uh, I don't know. Golly, that's a big question. Wait, what is it? Rock <laughs> documentary? Rockumentary. I, don't, I mean, Don't Look Back is really, that's really the one that everybody copies. And that's pretty good. Don't Look Back. Pretty good. What about MTV Cribs? You know, that's, uh, I, I can't believe that people let some film crew in their house. It's disgusting. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Like, oh, dude, these are my boxes, you know. It's like, <laughs> pathetic. Anyway. 
I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry. Somebody left. The producer of Cribs. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks, guys. So I'm going to.